Good morning, everyone, and welcome to episode 18, where we will be discussing the cardiovascular changes in aging. And as always, for those who are new here, we do a breakdown of the short answer question, and this is our format. We're going to review the examiner's report, and then after that, I'm going to show you um, where I get my information from. So we're going to do a literature review. I'll present the key concepts, answer any questions that you guys um, have, and then we're going to create an answer structure and write an answer to time together. Now, this is the 2019 question two paper, which is describe the cardiovascular changes that occur with aging. And certainly you can see how the exam has changed over the last couple of years to include questions like these, which are a lot more clinically relevant. So the last couple of years, you've seen um, the changes that have occurred with uh, morbid obesity. And now we are seeing this uh, segment for aging. So this is the exam's report. The question asked about the cardiovascular effects of aging. These should be differentiated from the effects of cardiovascular pathology, which are more prevalent as age increases. Discussing pathology in the absence on, of a discussion on the effects of aging per se failed to attract marks. And this is really uh, an important concept is that Yes, age is associated with an increase in cardiovascular pathology like coronary artery disease, but it certainly doesn't imply causation. So the majority of your answer shouldn't be focused around uh, the idea of pathology and its pathophysiological effects, but rather more so about the physiological effects of aging and the impact on um, the cardiovascular physiology. I think that you can include uh, a, a paragraph on this, but certainly no more than half a page. Now to achieve a pass in this question, candidates were required to demonstrate a broad understanding of the effects of aging on both the heart and the vascular system. And much like the examiner's report from last week, the report here doesn't actually list out the key concepts which would provide you a pass or provide you additional marks, but rather gives you a structure, a structure to be able to answer this question and to cover everything um, that the examiner deems important. And the structure that the examiner wants you to use here is to discuss the changes in the heart as well as the changes in the vascular system. Now, an exhaustive list of factual information alone was insufficient to gain high marks. In other words, whatever you list down had to have a logical flow to it. You don't want to be writing um, concepts in like diastolic dysfunction without actually explaining why it actually occurred. Candidates who omitted one of these systems entirely found it difficult to pass the question. Good answers attracting additional marks included discussion of how these physiological changes affect cardiovascular function. Excellent answers included discussion of, of how these changes affect the capacity to compensate with physiological perturbations. And I think the most common example here would be exercise. So I think that with our answer that we're going to construct, we certainly want to have a, um, a couple of lines discussing about exercise and how that impacts or rather how cardiovascular function in the, in the aging population limits the amount of exercise uh, that they can do. Now with the summary of the exam's reports, so he went through a structure rather than um, sort of key concepts. And again, talking about um, the anatomical changes related to the heart and blood vessels, as well as the physiological changes. And these would include the going through all the different cardiovascular functions, uh, the capacity for compensation. And I think we can also include some pathophysiology changes uh, as well. Now, with regards to aging, 
chapter 75 from Power and Camp actually provides a really good summary. Although the, the way that he's written it, um, it certainly doesn't give you the clarity, I think, to be able to summarize uh, what he's written. But he does cover a lot of the key concepts well, and there's only about two or three pages uh, to read. Okay. I've supplemented this with an article by Chetlin, and this is called Cardiovascular Physiology Changes with Aging. And this is something that uh, I literally just found off uh, Google Scholar. So I just typed in cardiovascular changes with aging. And these were one of the couple of articles that sort of came up just exactly word for word with what I wanted to, um, what I wanted to find out. And I also read another article. And what was really nice was that uh, a lot of what was written is, um, has a lot of symmetry. Okay, so I think that what uh, Chetlin has written actually supplements what Power and Cam has written as well. Now, the goals. So what I found was that you could actually summarize all the key changes of aging just with this simple mnemonic of A, B, C, D, E, F. In other words, A for aging. So aging is associated with B is for beta adrogenergic responsiveness, which decreases. C is a reduction in compliance in heart and arterial vessels. D is a deconditioning and disease. E is a reduction in electrical activity propagation. And F is fibrosis of cardiac valves, fibrosis and calcification of cardiac valves. And what I'm going to do is when I summarize the information from Power and Cam, I'm going to put them all into one of these categories here. Okay. Now, this is a summary of Power and Cam. So this is the definition. Aging implies a vulnerability to stress and a diminished ability to maintain homeostasis. And I quite like this definition. So this will be a definition that I'll be bringing uh, into the exam. Now, cardiovascular changes in the elderly, and elderly is defined as an age more than 60, is due to one, the aging process, two, prolonged deconditioning, and three, age-related disease. So you can see that uh, these would belong to the D section, deconditioning and disease. And again, as per the examiner's report, you don't want to focus too much on, on the disease and deconditioning process. Okay, but we can certainly add probably about one, maybe um, one fifth of our answer will be dedicated to this. Now, this will be covered under E for electrical activity. So there is a reduction in the intrinsic rate of the pacemaker cells in the heart. And this is due to two things. It's due to the fibrous infiltration of the sinoatrial node as well as loss of pacemaker cells. Now, I acknowledge that there will be some other texts which do talk about um, the infiltration of the AV node, as well as the loss of the pacemaker cells there. But Power and Cam does say that the AV node is preserved. Okay, but I do acknowledge that uh, there will be some other texts, and I thought, and I don't think it's it's uh, incorrect to say that other pacemaker cells within the heart are also affected as well. Now, importantly, there is no change to resting heart rate, and Power and Cam doesn't actually go and discuss why. But what we can do is we can go through the concepts, um, the rest of the concepts. And I think that uh, we can actually come up with an answer in terms of why, despite having a reduction in your intrinsic rate, your resting heart rate actually stays the same in elderly patients. Now, importantly, the maximum heart rate that can be achieved is, um, it goes from about 200 to 160. And you may have seen the formula maximal heart rate equals 220 minus age. And there's a newer one that's come out, over, I think, over the last couple of years, um, which is 220 minus age times 0 0.7. Okay. 
So those would be uh, two formulas that you can use to work out what the maximal heart rate is. Now with these changes, there is an increased risk of SVTs and VEs as well. Okay, SVT specifically uh, atrial fibrillation. Now C is compliance. So there is a reduction in compliance in ventricles, which cause diastolic dysfunction. And this is due to an increase in connective tissue. So there is a replacement of elastin with collagen, uh, deposits of amyloid and lipofusin, fibrosis of the endocardium as well. And this is quite nice. I think if you can remember this to um, add this into your answer to describe why there's a reduction in compliance. So there's, a, so there's an increase in connective tissue, loss of elastin and deposits of amyloid and lipofusin. Importantly, there is a reduction in the maximal stroke volume that the elderly patients can achieve. This is actually quite interesting because um, in exercise, it is the stroke volume which is actually maintained um, or increased due to the Frank Starling mechanism to maintain cardiac output, all right? But um, in terms of the maximal stroke volume that the elderly patient can achieve will be a lot less than what the young patient can achieve. And the reduction in heart rate um, leads to a reduction in the maximum exercise performance um, that can be achieved. Now, F is five for fibrosis. So there's fibrosis and calcification of the heart valves. And what happens is that you get valvular incompetence. So in other words, if you, if you think about the aortic valve, when you start getting calcification, it looks something like this. So, that, so, this, so this leads to a incompetence of the valve and uh, leads to aortic regurgitation, which leads to an increase in volume and can lead to eccentric hypertrophy and vice versa. Because these valves are fibrosed and calcified, they don't actually open and the orifice is actually reduced and that causes valvular stenosis, which increases the pressure and can lead to concentric hypertrophy. Now, D is for deconditioning or disease. So a sedentary lifestyle or age-related disease can cause a reduction in cardiac output. The interesting thing is that with healthy aging, so with regular physical exercise, it minimizes the decline in cardiac function. And as I said before, there is a reliance on the Frank Starling mechanism with exercise as your maximum heart rate is limited. And we'll go through this um, with the article and I'll show you a couple of graphs which actually demonstrate this as well. Now again, we're gonna um, go through another one for C for compliance. This is quite interesting. So there's a reduction in compliance in large arteries. And again, the mechanism is the same where there is an increase in fibrosis and calcification of these uh, large arteries and reduction in elastin as well. And that leads to an increase in your systolic and mean arterial pressure. Now, we know that if you reduce the compliance in your large artery, so your aorta, it leads to a reduction in your diastolic pressure because of the loss of the Winkessel effect. And just to quickly go through the Winkessel effect, what it describes is that the large arteries acts like another pump. So if you think about it, what happens is that the blood comes into here. And if these are compliant um, large arteries, they hold the blood here. And then subsequently, they contract to push the blood out. Okay. And this is called the Winkessel effect. And what happens in the elderly is that you lose that compliance. So you lose that Winkessel effect. And that is what is um, the cause of a reduction in diastolic pressure in the elderly patient. However, there is also a reduction in um, compliance in your vascular beds, and this will lead to an increase in peripheral resistance, which increases 
your diastolic pressure. So it increases your systolic as well as your diastolic pressure. And Power and Cam actually has a graph on this and I'll quickly go through this, I think, uh, where is it? Yeah, this slide here. So this slide here shows that there is a increase in your diastolic pressure as well as your systolic pressure. And that is because of an increase in or a reduction in compliance in your distal peripheral vessels. But you can see that after the age of 80, there is a reduction in diastolic pressure. And that is due to a reduction in compliance primarily in your large um, capacitance vessels, which leads to a loss of the Winkessel effect. Now there is an increase in your pulmonary vascular resistance, which leads to an increase in pulmonary pressures. And we'll go through some of the numbers there um, that Power and Cam talks about. Now B is for beta adrenergic. So there is a reduction in your beta adrenergic responsiveness. And the mechanisms are because of a reduction either in the number of receptors or affinity uh, for those receptors, as well as uh, the second messenger system. So a reduction in cyclic AMP generation. And importantly, there is a reduction in barrel receptor activation, and that can lead on to other things such as postural hypotension. So that will be something that uh, you can add on to your answer as well. So this graph here from Parencam uh, just shows how diastolic changes, uh, the type diastolic pressure changes. So as you um, get older, it increases, as I said, because of the increase in your peripheral resistance or reduction in compliance there. But then after that, the diastolic pressure starts dropping because of the loss of the wind castle effect. Now, this is a paragraph uh, from nuns. And this is an exercise that I quite like to do. So when I see something like this in healthy elderly people, pulmonary artery systolic pressure increases from the value of 20 millimeters of mercury in young adults to 26 millimeters of mercury. And pulmonary artery diastolic pressure rises from nine to 11 and pulmonary vascular resistance rises from 70 to 120 dynes uh, per second centi uh, per centimeter to the power of five. And this is what I want you guys to do. So we're gonna try to work out um, these numbers here. So pulmonary artery systolic pressure increases from a value of 20 in young adults to 26 and pulmonary artery diastolic pressure rises from nine to 11. And we wanna see whether we can calculate these values here. We wanna make sure that the values that Power and Cam have written down are actually correct. So this is the exercise. The exercise is we have in young patients, a pulmonary artery pressure of 20 systolic and nine diastolic, and in the elderly 20 systolic and 11 diastolic. Now, I want you guys to work out for me um, what the pulmonary vascular resistance is, assuming the cardiac output is five liters per minute and the left ventricular and diastolic pressure is eight millimeters of mercury. And we know that um, normal left ventricular and diastolic pressure ranges around six to 12. So I've just chosen uh, a middle number there. So for those of you who are watching this at home, what I want you to do for this exercise is pause this video at this point here and try to work out the pulmonary vascular resistance for both young and old using the numbers I have provided here. Think about some of the equations that you know. Think about how to get those um, numbers that are required for your equation, and then work through how to calculate pulmonary vascular resistance. And once you've had a go of that, um, continue to press play, and then we'll go through how we go about uh, thinking about calculating this answer here. <laughs> 
So welcome back to those who have paused the video. And this is how um, you go about thinking about pulmonary vascular resistance. Now, it's all based on Ohm's law, where V equals I times R. And V it represents the change in pressure, I represents uh, flow, and R rep represents resistance. So that we can say that pulmonary vascular resistance equals the change in pressure for a given flow. And that equals P1 minus P2 divided by flow. And so the question is, what is P1? What is P2? And what is flow? Now, hopefully you should have figured out that P1 is very similar to calculating your systemic vascular resistance, where you need your mean arterial pressure. The difference here is that you need your mean pulmonary arterial pressure. And P2, so P2 on the systemic side is your right atrial pressure. And for this, for this side over here, P2 should be your left ventricular and diastolic pressure, which you can actually calculate using your pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. And that is divided by your cardiac output. And knowing this formula here, we can now go ahead and calculate the mean pulmonary arterial pressure in the young and old, and then after that, calculate the pulmonary vascular resistance. So how do we calculate the mean pulmonary arterial pressure? Well, it's similar to cal calculating MAP, where MAP equals one third systolic plus two third diastolic. So that the mean pulmonary artery arterial pressure in the young equals 20 divided by three plus nine times two over three. And using your calculator, so I've done these calculations uh, all beforehand, that equals 12.7 millimeters of mercury. And in the old, it is 26 divided by three plus 11 times two over three. And that equals 16 millimeters of mercury. And knowing the mean pulmonary arterial pressures for both young and old, we can now calculate the pulmonary vascular resistance. So the pulmonary vascular resistance in the young will equal 12.7 minus eight divided by five, which equals 0 0.94 millimeters of mercury per liter per minute. And in the old, it should be 16 minus eight divided by five, and that equals 1.6 millimeters of mercury per liter per minute. Now we want to convert this to dynes multiplied by second uh, per centimeter to the power of five. And to do that, we need a conversion factor. And the conversion factor here is 80. So we multiply these two numbers by 80. And that should give us the values that are representative uh, in terms of dynes multiplied by seconds per centimeter to the power of five. So 0.94 multiplied by 80 is approximately 75. Dynes multiplied by seconds to centimeter to the power of five. And 1.6 times 80 equals 128. Dynes multiplied by second centimeter to the power of five. And that's how you go about calculating pulmonary vascular resistance for both young and old. Now, I don't think, in fact, you won't be expected to, to calculate this for the exam because this requires a calculator and they're not allowed in the exam. But I think you do need to know the formulas that are involved and you do need to know how the formulas are derived. 
So in other words, this formula up here, you'll need to know how to calculate mean pulmonary arterial pressure. You also need to know how to calculate left ventricular and diastolic pressure. And you also need to know how to calculate or work out what the cardiac output is. Now, with these numbers here, let's quickly check back and see how they correlate to what Power and Cam have written. And you can see from Power and Cam, they have said very similar numbers. So pulmonary vascular resistance rises from 70 to 120. And that's really nice when you can have um, the numbers that are published in a book and work it out and they actually match. I think that hopefully strengthens the concepts in your head regarding the idea of pulmonary artery pressures, um, left ventricular and diastolic pressure, cardiac output, and how you can use those numbers to calculate pulmonary vascular resistance. Now, we're going to go through the article which I also attached, which is the um, summary of Chetlin, Physiology of Cardiovascular Aging. And he describes aging as a loss of function in organ systems and an increase in incidence of disease. I quite, I quite like the Power and Cam definition where they talked about um, aging implies a increased vulnerability in stress as well as a reduction in your ability to maintain homeostasis. So I'm, I, I much prefer Power and Cam's definition rather than uh, Chetland's one here, okay? This is the table which summarizes everything. Two seconds, someone's just come through the door. Okay, so this is the table that summarizes all the physiological changes associated with aging. And what I'm gonna do is, it looks quite complicated here, but remember my, um, the system that I showed you. So aging causes, B, B is for uh, beta adrenergic uh, receptors, C is compliance, D is for disease or deconditioning, E is for electrical activity, and F is for fibrosis. And we're gonna try to include all these concepts into one of those, okay? And what you can see is that um, it actually all fits. So with regards to C, there is a reduction in compliance in the arterial tree, which leads to an increase in afterload. Um, there is also myocardial cell hypertrophy, which then leads to a delayed relaxation, which is a reduction in your compliance or so decrease in left ventricular compliance. There is a reduction in electrical activity because of apoptosis of the sinoatrial pacemaker cells and fibrosis and loss of bundles of uh, the loss of his bundle cells, which leads to a slower intrinsic heart rate. F is for fibrosis and calcification of the heart and valves. And you can see that that's associated with aortic valve sclerosis and stenosis. And then B is for the beta adrenergic uh, receptors. And so there is decreased responsiveness in, the, in those. Interestingly, what happens is that there is an increase in catecholamines. And that's been one of the postulated mechanisms into why resting heart rate is maintained, okay? So explains why your resting heart rate is maintained in the elderly. So even though you've got a reduction in responsiveness um, in your beta receptors, there is a compensatory increase in the catecholamines um, and this might explain also why the resting heart rate is the same, despite having a slower intrinsic heart rate. And then uh, D is for anything that uh, increases the incidence of disease or deconditioning. Now, this graph is really interesting because what it shows you is um, how the... Frank Starling mechanism is maintained 
in the elderly during exercise or rather how why it's actually important in the elderly so a couple of um key things are and so what i'll do is i just get my red pen so the circles the circles are the circles are elderly patients okay so all these are for um, elderly patients and then the the triangles the triangles represent the young so these triangles here are the young subjects here okay and what this diagram shows are the responses to exercise and you and as you can see as you increase exercise you increase your cardiac output and what they want to show is the relationship between um, heart rate and as well as your stroke volume as well okay because those are the two components of cardiac output your heart rate multiplied by your stroke volume and so you can see the relationships between them both and remember that your stroke volume equals your end diastolic volume minus your end systolic volume and what is really interesting is that during exercise in the elderly patient you can see that end diastolic volume increases okay so this is end diastolic volume here and in elderly patients you can see that as they increase um, their exercise and and they want to increase their cardiac output the end diastolic volume increases but their end systolic volume pretty much remains the same and so the difference between here and here is their stroke volume and we can come over to this side of the graph here and what it shows is that the maximum heart rate that the elderly patient can achieve is a lot less than what a young person can achieve so it's this line here that's your heart rate but the interesting thing is that their stroke volume increases okay and that is due to the preservation of the frank starling mechanism now compare that to the young so with the young what you'll see is that your end diastolic volume comes up a little, but then after that starts dropping off. So you could say it doesn't really change uh, that much or changes by about you know, 20 mils, but their end systolic volume actually decreases. So their contractility or the ability to, con to contract, to maintain stroke volume um, increases. And the difference between here to here is their stroke volume. But what is really interesting is that if you come over to this graph here, so that you, you can see that their heart rate increases, but their stroke volume, it initially goes up, but then after that, it comes down with increasing exercise, all right? In other words, the cardiac output in the young is maintained through a combination of both heart rate and stroke volume but certainly becomes more dependent on heart rate as the intensity of the exercise increases. Whereas for the elderly patient, it's primarily maintained through stroke volume. And this actually fits in quite well with one of the graphs, um, which is the physio physiology of uh, exercise. And you can see here, this is from Stolting, I'm uh, sorry, from Power and Cam. And you got stroke volume here. And again, the symmetry is that um, your stroke volume increases, but then after that, it starts decreasing. And that fits into quite, you know, quite well to in terms of what happens in the young. Now, the only um, criticism I have about this diagram here is this, okay, is the heart rate. Because We've, we have an assumption here that the heart rate is going up to 250 and above during heavy exercise. And I think that this graph would have been better represented 
if the maximum heart rate was 200 here, okay, rather than 250. Because we know that um, once you start increasing your heart rate above a, above a certain limit, you know, whatever it is, you know, you start reducing your diastolic time, your diastolic filling time. And that re leads to reduction in your end diastolic volume, which then leads to a reduction in your stroke volume. Okay. And this would, uh, and if you look at the other graph again, you know, the maximum heart rate here is 180. So I think, I think this one here for, from Power and Cam, whilst the, the, um, the diagrams itself look right, it's just the labeling of the Y axes, which I think create a bit of confusion. Now, this graph, uh, sorry, this table here is from that article uh, by Chetlin. And what it shows is that during exercise in the elderly patient is very similar to beta blockade in the young patient. In other words, there is a maximal reduction, there, sorry, there's a reduction in your maximal aerobic capacity or what I call um, VO2 max. There is a reduction in your maximal heart rate. There is an increase in your end diastolic volume because as you cause as you have as you reduce your heart rate you increase your diastolic time which le which leads to an increase in your end diastolic volume um, but it, you do get a reduction in contractility so in in terms of your ejection fraction that reduces the maximum cardiac output is reduced or stays the same so remember that cardiac output in patients who are older is maintained with um, the frank starling mechanism and through stroke volume and there's also an increase in your plasma catecholamines as well. So in summary, remember A, B, C, D, E, F. And, and look, I when I put this in my answer, I won't go down in terms of this order here. I won't go down A, B, C, D, E, F, all right? What I'll do is I will, I will um, talk about compliance first because I think um, that's the most important. Then I'll talk, probably talk about uh, electrical activity propagation. I'll talk about the beta adrenergic responsiveness, I'll talk about the fibrosis and calcification of cardiac valves. And then finally, I'll talk about deconditioning and disease. So, so just use this, you know, ABCDEF template just as a way to recall the important concepts. But I think that the way that you present it, because you want to build a story and I think that it is, it is a little bit of a nuance, but you want to show that what's really important in aging are the changes in compliance, the changing in electrical activity, and the changing in your beta adrenergic responsiveness. And then after that, you can add on what happens with the fibrosis and calcification of cardiac valves, and also the impact of deconditioning and disease as well. Now, we're going to use the examiner structure to create a basic framework. So this would be a very similar framework to um, what we used for morbid obesity. And in other words, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the anatomical changes leading to the physiological changes. Um, and then after that, um, talk about some of the pathophysiological consequences. And so with the anatomical changes, we can summarize it that the heart undergoes uh, concentric left ventricular hypertrophy. And this is where you can explain about the mechanisms involved with that. There is also a reduction in your pacemaker cells and a reduction in your beta adrenal septors. Okay. In the vascular system, uh, there is fibrosis and loss of elastin. So these are the anatomical changes that occur. And you know, with concentric hypertrophy, understanding that also that that is also a physiological response. So what we need to do is just talk about the anatomical changes and concentric hypertrophy, when you think about it um, anatomically, can occur because of, again, fibrosis, loss of elastin. And one that I didn't actually point out before is um, myocyte death. I think it was in the table um, before, but I didn't, sorry, I didn't point this out to you. In, in, in your myocardial cell hypertrophy, there's what's called dropout of cardiac myocytes. 
that's important to know because what happens is that um, when you think about it in terms of you know number of myocytes you have, all right, with aging, let's say a couple die off, what happens is that there's compensation and these ones hypertrophy, okay, to maintain your myocardial mass. All right. So that's so that's the mechanism in aging is that you get myocard myocardial cell dropout or death, and then after that you get hypertrophy of the ones that are left over. Now with the physiological changes in the heart, a reduction in compliance um, and, and an increase in concentric hypertrophy leads to diastolic dysfunction. Uh, there is also a reduction in your intrinsic heart rate, a reduction in beta adrenergic responsiveness, and there's also an increase in circulating catecholamines. With the changes in your blood vessels, there is an increase in afterload, which causes an increase in your systolic blood pressure. And I should also put an increase in your diastolic blood pressure as well. Okay. But then also after the age of 75 to 80, you get the reduction in your diastolic blood pressure due to the um, loss of the wind castle effect. And that leads to an increase in your pulse pressure. Some of the pathophysiological changes. So with exercise, there is a reduction in your VO2 max. Um, certainly your maximum heart rate is limited. Um, importantly, your end diastolic volume and systolic volume are increased with the Frank Starling mechanism. And um, if you haven't got the updated notes, I think I put maintained, but um, I think the more correct term is that stroke volume is increased in the elderly with exercise. And then finally, uh, disease. So I think you can, with this format, you can talk about the fibrosis of cardiac valves, uh, fibrosis and calcification of cardiac valves and what it leads to. So it can lead to both aortic stenosis and aortic incompetence, which leads to regurgitation. So re remember with aortic regurgitation, um, it is a different mechanism, okay, when you're talking about um, fibrosis and calcification. So with fibrosis and calc calcification, you're talking about incompetence where the valve doesn't close um, fully. So this leads to regurgitation. Whereas um, when you think about um, other forms of regurgitation, most commonly sort of the loss of the structure of the annular ring, uh, that leads to you know, this, the annular ring actually increasing and then the valves not closing fully. Okay, so that, that, that's a, um, a different kind of mechanism. And then finally, you know, I'll, I'll just quickly touch on coronary artery disease, if even, and, and just quickly mention that, um, you know, old aging is associated with increasing cardiovascular disease, just such as coronary artery disease, which can impact uh, cardiovascular function. Now, this will be the structure that, that I'll use so I'll have my I'll have a definition of aging, and I'll have um, that uh, the the definition from Power and Cam, which is the increase uh, vulnerability to stress as well as a reduction in the ability to maintain homeostasis. And then after that, um, I'll, I'll use I'll use sort of my template, but you can certainly use the the anatomical, physiological, and pathophysiological consequences. I think that's quite a standard way of uh, discussing it. Um, but the way that I'll frame it is changes in compliance, changes in electrical activity, changes in um, fibrosis and calcification of the valves, the beta adrenergic responsiveness, and deconditioning and disease. I'll, I'll probably flip the order of uh, these two around. I think um, more interesting to talk about this as the third one. All right. Now, I just need to give a shout out to Nathan Blakely from WA. And he's just pointed out that in the exam, with the um, with what you're allowed to bring in, it's a 15 centimeter clear ruler. So it's not a 30 centimeter uh, ruler. It's it's a uh, 15 centimeter. So I went out to Office Works and got one. It's about uh, 40 cents. This one. And again, my blue and black pens. And oh yes. I forgot to also mention that there is a strong possibility that you will you will have to do the exam with a mask on. So as always, um, 
I think it's always good practice, especially now leading up to the exam to start. I think it's really important, I think, to replicate uh, these things and making sure that on the day you feel comfortable. Okay, you guys ready? And let's go. So I'll have my definition here. And CBS changes due to one a reduction in compliance, two a reduction in electrical activity, and three a reduction in data. Adrenergic responsiveness. Four fibrosis and calcification of cardiac bells and five deconditioning. And increase incidence of disease. So, with my definition, aging implies one increasing vulnerability, stress, and two decrease ability to maintain homeostasis, homeostasis. Now the cardiovascular changes are due to, due to, and what I'm going to put is uh, elderly is age more than 60, so a reduction in compliance in both heart and blood vessels due to loss of elastin um, and replacement with collagen increasing process position of myeloid and lipofusin and this leads to an increase in your afterload which increases systolic and diastolic blood pressures an increase in afterload can lead to centric atrophy, colic dysfunction, um, hypertrophy, and the exacerbated with myocardial cell dropout. Okay. And there is a reduction in diastolic uh, BP after the age of 75 and 80 due to loss of wind castle effect and then increase in 
shape. Resistance. Okay, reduction in electrical activity due to fibrous infiltration of the SA node, as well as as well as loss of pacemaker cells leads to decrease in your intrinsic heart rate and increases the risk of SVT and the ease resting heart is maintained however because of an increase in circulating catecholamines. Okay, so the beta adrenergic responses uh, due to one decrease um, beta adrenal receptors for affinity for those receptors to decrease in cyclic AMP um, generation. Um, leads to decrease in baroreceptor activation leads to postural tension and also decrease heart rate variability during a cell. Fibrosis calcification of cardiac valves. Um, I'll just quickly write aortic stenosis. Overload concentric hypertrophy, aortic incompetence, regurgitation leads to volume overload eccentric. Hypertrophy. Um, now, I'm going to quickly talk about exercise. So, decrease VO2 max um, during exercise. So, sedentary lifestyle contribute. Otherwise, secondary to a uh, decrease. and just like volume and stroke volume by the like darling uh, mechanism and if you put aging also associated with increasing honoring Tree disease. However, does not imply causation of the aging 